Welcome back to the GMT Retail Story, Episode 3, where we're going to learn everything about how did they vouch early for independent watchmakers. So before talking about GMT becoming a reference for high-end independent watch brands, we have to take a step back because before retailers, we were actually distributors. So after my father closed the contract with the Jäger Le Cult in 2003, he already met several key players in what was then becoming the second generation of independent watchmakers. Uh, so he met uh, young Francois Paul Journe in 1999 in Baselworld uh, when he launched this brand and the first uh, 20 series, a uh, series of 20 pieces of the Suscription Tourbillon. Uh, but he couldn't work with F.P. Journe because he had a non-competitive um, contract with Jaeger Le Coultre. Uh, so as soon as the partnership with Jaeger fades and uh, is not there anymore, the first person that he contacts again is Francois Paul Journe that uh, came to Milan and uh, they discussed, they shake hands. And uh, that's the first contract that, uh, that my father closed with, uh, again, with uh, an independent watch brand in, um, it was end 2003, beginning of 2004. The second brand my father started to work with is Harry Winston, uh, back then led by Max Busser that he met in uh, 1992 when Max joined Jaeger Le Cult. So Max was called um, to, to do a miracle. So uh, to take a jewelry brand that was Harry Winston and to make it become a reference in watchmaking. And how he did it? By binding the name Harry Winston to the best independent watchmakers at the era. The first one was F.P. Journe, then they came uh, Antoine Prezioso, Vianney Alter, Christophe Claret, uh, Felix Bongarner from Urwerk, etc., etc. So the second brand is actually Harry Winston. The third one is Chanel. Uh, so my father got approached by the Bartimer family to distribute uh, Chanel watches and jewelry on the Italian market. And that was the year of the launch of the J12 White, which was a big revolution, especially for fashion brands. This was actually the start. Then um, after a couple of years, my father met Felix Baumgartner from Urwerk, thanks to Max Busser and the Opus series uh, with the Opus 5. Then what happened? We were only distributors. so. My father was working with the best retailers in Italy to display, uh, to educate, and to uh, present these kind of brands. Uh, but traditional retailers were not the right fit for those kind of brands. Imagine a huge retailer that has all the big traditional brands, Rolex, Patek, Vacheron, Cartier, etc., etc. name one. They don't need to do a proper storytelling about the brand, the man, research and development, it's a completely different way to sell and to present the watches. So he started to understand that he needed to have his own platform where to address the public and not only the retailers. So that's how the idea of GMT started. GMT is actually great masters of time. Uh, it's a platform to talk not only about the watch itself, but also the creator behind. FP Journe would not be the same without the man himself behind the brand. MBNF would not be the same without Max Busser behind it. Resense would not be the same without Benoit Mintien. And everybody has their own uh, approach to creation and to watchmaking, because they're not all watchmakers. Among the three I mentioned, only Journe is a watchmaker. So the first GMT boutique uh, was then opened in 2007 in Porto Cervo in Sardinia. A holiday place, a summer location. Why is that? Because a certain kind of collectors from abroad from US, from Middle East, from uh, Russia and from Far East were already aware um, of independent watch brands and they were already collecting independent watch brands. While Italian collectors, um, they've always been super traditional and it took a while before they started to understand that there was a door after Patek Philippe and Lange, a door which is very hard to close once you opened it. In the same year, I joined the company and uh, we, quickly, we quickly understood that we needed to have um, a place, a store, um, a living room also in Milan because it's our city and it was already fast growing back then and uh, today much more. So we opened in Milan in 2010 and 
that was the real change. Uh, in the same year, we opened our first social media channels and we started to get to know collectors from all around the world, uh, which quickly became a community. Um, we started to do the same with Italian collectors that, as I said, that were, they were less interested in this, kind of, in this kind of watches, in this kind of creations back then. What happened is that the market has changed. Social media helped a lot, internet for sure uh, in general. And in the last five or six years, we saw a shift and much more interest, also due to COVID, uh, about independent watch brands. I think what's interesting uh, for collectors is the fact that independent watch brands are the more creative ones. They don't talk with marketing or with brand ambassadors or with great billboards around the cities. They talk with the products themselves. That is the point. And that is what collectors today are appreciating the personal touch, the fact that they can interact with the creator of his watch. The main marketing topic of independent watch brands are the products themselves. Many years have passed, uh, we kept doing research, we kept modifying our way to connect with collectors and customers all, all over the world. And I think it's also thanks to that, uh, that we've been put on the map as uh, one of the most influential retailers in the world, talking about, of course, independent watch making. Me and my brother, we are very proud to be the third generation uh, after what our grandfather has created, our father has continued, and what we are doing today and all the plans we have for the future.